This is the second chapter, and we are now starting the second part. I will introduce a couple of tools in order to properly diagnose your problem, and also I will provide a couple of examples. One of them indeed includes the problem statement. During the exploration phase, in order to design properly your research objective, we need to diagnose firstly the problem, which is capitalized with a proper problem statement. During this section, during this exploration, we will have enough ingredients for you to properly define your goal, the goal of the research project. During the exploration phase and towards the problem statement, we really need to read a lot, key journal papers, textbooks, patents, or even official reports from the company, organization, university. We need to enrich the amount of background. We need to fully understand the problem. And this bibliography should be all over the document, not only in the introduction or during the problem diagnosis, but also when defining your goal, when defining your methods and tools, or even when you are defining your deliverable and validation process. When you have read enough documentation, you have created your own bibliography, a draft of the bibliography, when you have enough background information, then it's time to discuss. It's time to look for the opinion of the stakeholders, to take into account their desires, and to translate these desires into technical requirements. Everything should be done to enrich the problem statement, which means that if you are preparing a stakeholder analysis, it will be really strange if that analysis comes after the problem statement. And that's a common mistake that we normally see. Now, daily supervisors, they can also help you out gathering uh, with the gathering of enough information, academic advisors, or simply experts of the field. During the course unit, we will have the teaching assistants. They will take the role of supervisors, they will take the role of problem owners, or they will take the role of experts, depending on the case that you are dealing with. Reading, discussion, and then comes the report, reporting. Certainly, the problem analysis, or these weekly reports, or the project's report, or the project presentation, those are official communication channels. Needs to be written. And that actually is what makes the difference. Your findings in terms of the discussion, in terms of the reading, should be written and they should be given in a coherent story. You should define actually the outline of that story, whether it's going to be first the problem diagnosis and then comes with some tools for the problem diagnosis. And later on, of course, we will go to the goal, questions, methods, tools, and so on. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is a cycle. Read, discuss, report, repeat. Basically, this is the mantra for the course unit. One way to identify potential causes for the problem or some sort of effect is the so-called fishbone diagram. This classical technique should come immediately after interviews, reading, brainstorming sessions, where you categorize all the potential causes of the problem. Again, this technique is not meant directly to write down your problem statement, but at least you can structure all the potential causes of the problem in one figure. And this is the, the definition provided by the book, the Quality Toolbox, and the reference can be found in the right side of the slide. Via Google Scholar and Mendeley, I have found the three most cited papers that make use of fishbone diagrams in the engineering field, in some sort of engineering field. For instance, here we have the Journal of Quality in Maintenance Engineering. Now, this fishbone diagram is addressing the issue of poor nozzle assembly process. Classically, we have five branches, man, tools, environment, method, or information. And so you can see that each of these branches or each of these, each of these bones have also potential causes. Now, the second one is this fishbone diagram that comes from Procedure Manufacturing. So you see that here we have a different type of name for the, for the main bones. Legislations, cost and capacity, technology, quality and demand. It means that the fishbone diagram is not fixed to only five categories. It depends a lot on the problem you're addressing. And this is 
a problem connected to obstacles in, to plastic recovery and recycling. Another issue, and one of the, the, the most cited papers that made use of this technique just to find the potential causes and that came immediately after brainstorm sessions and bibliography uh, studies. This is the last example, and it's connected to the problem of tank accidents, and it was provided by the Journal of Loss Prevention in the Process Industries. Eight branches are adding enough insights about the potential causes for that problem, going from operational errors to mechanical errors, such as piping or tank cracks. This tool, indeed, will provide new insights if you make use of that. But certainly, you need to defend your assumptions. If you make use of the tool, and if you claim that one of the branches is having some sort of specific causes, then we will ask, of course, where are those assumptions coming from? Are they coming from literature, or are coming from directly from the interview with the informant, or the specialist, or the problem owner? The second tool is the so-called why-what analysis model. And this is an analysis tool towards the preparation of the problem statement. We start here, in the original problem, a brief description of what you consider the problem is so far. Now we go for the why do we want to solve this problem. We go for the higher context, the broader problem. But also, we need to know what is stopping us, what is actually stopping us uh, from solving the problem. Now, we go then to the narrower problem. We really get in depth into the technicities of the problem. And so this is a, so this is a model that can be used together with the Fishman diagram or together with the five whys or any other tool that you consider necessary to understand the problem that has to be solved. Here, I am assuming that actually you downloaded the document, the presentation, you read the case that is in the previous slide, and you have drawn your proposed why what model. Here we have my proposed solution, and now you can compare it with your own solution. The problem, brief problem statement, the original problem. So the laser technology is unable to effectively answer business opportunities. Now if we go to the broader context, and we can see that the company's growth is being affected because they are not going to be able to provide the service and the competition is going to outperform, outperform them. But if we go to the very specific details of the problem, the what is stopping us to solve the problem, we will go through the properties of the materials and the properties of the artifacts being developed with the laser technology. And they are not consistently rich, which means that we may have an issue with the setting of the parameters of the machine, connected to very specific alloys. So you can see, we go to a higher technical, a very specific technical description, but also we can see in the same diagram, the broader problem. And again, this is just a tool for you to have a perspective of, of what is going on in terms of the why and in terms of the what. The why what analysis model was originally proposed by Anamalai 2013. Here is the reference to the paper. Actually, if you go to the paper, you will find two additional examples. An example on the quality problem and an example on the high equipment downtime. The final tool that can be part of the problem analysis that will bring insights into the problem context towards the design of the problem statement 
and also towards the design of your research objective is the stakeholder analysis. And this is again the exploration phase for the research objective. The idea is to interview the stakeholders, that people that has a stake in the project, whether with high interest or high power. We will go from desires, but normally it's given by fake language, not so technical sometimes. And we need to translate those desires into real technical, technical specifications. We need to define these technical specifications. And normally you can prepare a table. You can prepare a table with three columns. The column of the stakeholder, the column with the, with the words of the stakeholder in terms of desire, and a column with actually the technical specifications in terms of numbers, physical quantities, KPIs, technical specifications in general. The language certainly should not be fake during the technical specifications. And you can include some specifications at the very beginning of your analysis, and they may evolve towards the execution of the project. They may change. Because when executing the project, of course, you will have new insights. For the stakeholder analysis, we will make use of the Mendeleev's diagram. It's a diagram that has two axes, interest versus power. It's a diagram that brings together four types of, of stakeholders. And this diagram, of course, was proposed by Ackerman and Edin in 2011. I strongly recommend you to go to the paper and carefully read it. Now there are four different stakeholders in the diagram. Let's start with one of the most important ones, the problem owner, the one that has high power and high interest. They may be other players, other key players in your, in your, in your project. That is not only the problem owner. And one example, so you are solving a, an issue, a bottleneck in a production line, it means that most probably the problem owner is the production manager because he has a lot of decision power and a lot of interest in maximizing the efficiency of the production. But also in the same organization, in the same company, we have the CEO. The CEO may look with interest this project or not, but certainly he has power, has, has power to decide, continue or not with the project uh, with respect to project. So he becomes a context setter. In the same example, let's assume that you are proposing a potential solution, a little bit of a complicated system that requires more maintenance, but certainly solves the problem. Then the, the manager for maintenance will have high interest in your proposed solution because it really affects his work. But since he is not a key player, at least not for this hypothetical case, he becomes a subject, low power, but high interest. And finally, in the same example, we can mention the operators. The operators will become the crowd. You may listen to them, uh, hear them, hear them out, see what are their desires, and if those desires can become also technical requirements. But certainly for this case, we can assume that the representative of the operators it's going to be the production manager. And sometimes it's not even necessary to mention them. But they, they will become crowd. I have provided two examples. And you can find those examples in the slides of the second chapter in the Nestor tool. My recommendation is to read those cases and to Proceed with your own version of the stakeholder analysis and to compare it with my proposed solutions, also found in the slides. Please recall that the techniques that we have seen so far, the stakeholder analysis, the why what model, the, the fishbone diagram, they are part of the problem analysis. They will provide insights about the problem towards the formulation of your problem statement and also as a part of the exploration phase towards the design of the research objective. Now we are ready to continue with the second stage, which is the formulation of the research objective.